Okay, if we can get everyone to come and take a seat over here. We're going to get started. Okay, first I'm going to bring up uh, Blake and Cassie from SACA to say a few words about how this all came to be tonight. Hi, everybody. For anybody who doesn't know, my name is Cassidy Pasher, and I am the current president of the Student American Chiropractic Association. My name is Blake Rumbelow. I'm the past president, immediate past president. Immediate past president. Immediate past president. His favorite president. thing to say right now. Uh, so first, we would like to w wish our SAC advisor, Dr. Patrick Montgomery, where you at, a very happy birthday. So everybody make sure you run and tell him happy birthday at some point today. Mm -hmm. Uh, we again want to thank Dr. Tuck and Dr. Mathis for taking out time in their busy schedules to come to Logan and talk to us about evidence-based, patient-centered care within their clinics and why now is the best time in history to be a chiropractor. We would also like to thank the Logan administration, faculty, and staff for making this a possibility. Now more than ever, it's become vital for us as chiropractors to be able to accurately diagnose and provide the evidence that supports what we do and why it works. All too often, we hear that the only way to be successful is to get patients in and out as quickly as possible without regard for their overall whole health. Collaboration has become a key factor in what we are capable <clears throat> of doing for our patients and being able to work with other healthcare professionals to aid in the health of the whole patient, which has never been more important than it is now. So that's kind of what our talk is about tonight because patients want our care, but they also wanna know that they are receiving the best care possible. In order to do this, we must take the latest research, clinical experience, and patient values, combine those all together, and apply them to every single patient every single day. Collaboration is the wave of the future, and we have to join forces with other healthcare providers in order to progress forward. Dr. Ray Tuck and Dr. Lee Mathis have found success with, collabor with collaborative, evidence-based, patient-centered care, and we want to thank them again for taking the time to share that knowledge with us, for bringing this talk tonight, and tell us why it's the greatest time in history to be a chiropractor. So thank you guys all again so much for coming out and joining us. I won't put too much pressure on you guys for a little bit, a little bit. So I'm Dr. DeBone, I'm the Dean of the College of Chiropractic for those who don't know me. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Tuck for some years now. Um, he graduated from National in 1997. I graduated from there in 1989. And Dr. Mathis graduated from Palmer in 2006. So guys have been out in the field for a little while, been out for 30 years now for me and 20 some odd for you and at you're still. <laughs> you got some miles to go. But you know, I, I had the pleasure of going to dinner with Dr. Tuck and Dr. Mathis last night and Dr. Montgomery, Dr. Goodman, Dr. Undercoffler and some of the, the SACA students as well. And it's kind of interesting the conversations that come up. This is a great time to be a chiropractor. It really, really is. In 30 years I've been out, Dr. Montgomery was saying in 40 now, we've been at 43. It really is a, a great time. But what you have to be careful of, those great times, it's precipitous though. I mean, it's not guaranteed. You know, in 1936, Churchill, one of, his, one of my favorite quotes by him is this, there's danger on our path, and there is. We have no right to look behind us. We can only look forward. And my other favorite that goes along with that is Mika Brzezinski on Morning Joe keeps saying, stop tripping by the stuff that's behind you. you know? But Dr. Tuck and Dr. Dr. Tuck especially knows this, Dr. Mathis has seen it, I'm sure Dr. Montgomery has seen it. We trip up by our own past at times, so we really have to look forward. And the ACA, it is a great time to be a chiropractor. It is a great time to be with the ACA. When I first got out of school, it was the, the association to join. It stood for something. You knew who you were when you were an ACA doc. You knew what it stood for. And you knew why you joined it. A little trouble in the mid-90s there, where they kind of lost their identity. They tried to broaden the tent a little bit, kind of invite everybody in, and it doesn't work. You got to stand for something or you know, fall for anything. I'm full of quotes tonight, though, aren't I? 
Dr. Tuck took ACA through probably one of the tougher times. He took the stand, put out the, the choose wisely. Not everyone agrees with it. You know what the best deals are? The deals, the deals where no one's happy. That means everybody got something they needed. And that's where we're at today. Um, we're maturing as a profession. And as we grow older and mature, there's growing pains that come with this. There's gonna be a lot of things you disagree with. There's gonna be a lot, but you know what? There's a civil discourse we all have to have and, and bring this forward. And our students here are starting to hear that more and more from us. Let's talk it out. It's not that Dr. Mathis was from Palmer. I spent three years at Palmer's radiology residency. So I understand a different side, a different aspect of the way chiropractic was taught. I think I grown more from that experience and I've grown from most other experiences I've had in this profession. I also worked seven years in a hospital, saw the other side of this too. Some are, we do a great job. Um, the patients really do care for us. But until the healthcare catches up with what we're doing, it starts paying us for the stuff we don't do, which is really where the, um, we'll make a, a big difference. And I'm sure they're gonna talk more about that today. So. I, I really was happy when they, were, they they'd agreed to come because it is really an honor for me to introduce both of these guys. They really have taken a model of private practice and you know our, our institutions can take a lesson from them of how they're running their practice because this is really how we should be running our institutions as well. It's evidence-based, informed care, looking forward, respecting the past, but not tripping over it, looking forward to where we're going. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Tuck and Dr. Mathis. Is this, is this microphone working? Is this microphone working? Hello. Hello. There it is. All right. Well, first of all, thank you guys. You guys have been awesome. Your campus is beautiful. I've, I've had such a warm welcome from everybody. Uh, and, and I want to thank you guys for, for, for all the hospitality. Um, you know, when we were trying to come up with a title for this talk, it was like, you know, it's the most awesomest time. It's the greatest time in the whole wide world. Uh, we awesome. I mean, you know, but, but ultimately we decided to settle on it is the greatest time in history to be a chiropractor. Uh, we hope today that we can share uh, some of that, uh, uh, of our thoughts on that. Um, we do plan on leaving a little time because we're what you call conversational uh, 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 talk givers. And the reason is because we really like to make sure that, that, that you guys are a part of this as well because you guys are a key component and you may have some really interesting insight to help this conversation uh, go to the next level. And we hope this will be the start of many conversations for you guys as we look forward. So with under no ado, you want to... Thank you, sir. He's not going to get far. Uh, we'll, we'll bounce back and forth a couple of times. When asked why he was the greatest goal scorer in history, Wayne Gretzky said this, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. So to tag on the Dr. DeBonos, don't get tripped up on the things behind us. Our goal today is very simple. It's to show how the ACA is working to take chiropractic not to where the puck has been or where healthcare has been, but where healthcare is going to intercept it there and do so in a way that we pose ourselves as, as I don't know, world dominators in healthcare as chiropractic um, practitioners. We, we like sharing this information with chiropractic schools, especially um, that, that are there to continue the, the successful upbringing, if you will, of young chiropractors. Um, just kind of an overarching goal uh, for this talk today. The objectives that we like to touch on are three. I, I like doing things in three. We, we taught a, a class earlier today or spoke in a class where you know we touched on the three-legged stool of coding and billing, <laughs> the three C's as it were. Um, we also have three objectives for this evening's chat. We want to expand upon patient-centered care, swap the definition up just a little bit, allow ourselves to step into the ownership role of patient-centered care, um, the second thing we'd like to do is discuss options for care and practice today. Students are, you know, in, in the, the class we spoke in, Dr. Brinkman's class, she let me know that, you know, there, there's kind of a, a tightrope walk. Do I accept insurance? Do I go on cash? Well, I do both. 
I have one foot in both arena and I'd like to share how we do that in our clinic systems um, and, and it, that being the type of practice we'll discuss and define what a successful clinic looks like. Blake mentioned earlier, you know, it, it's not necessarily the, the chiropractor that's seeing 600 a week, um, you know, and, and, and making the million dollar practice. That's not necessarily the definition of a successful practice in today and in tomorrow's um, health arena. Um, so those are just some of the, the objectives that we'd like to go over. So think about these objectives as we go into each one, jot down any questions you have. And, and like Ray said, we, we, this, this is conversation for us. Uh, old Mutt and Jeff here, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a good time and we'd like it to be interactive and conversational with you as well. So please hit us with questions um, toward the end. But first, who are we? I mean, two, two screaming, extremely dashing, handsome uh, young men with these crazy accents. Who are we? What, what are we here for? Um, you know, I'm going to let Dr. Tuck take a swing at that one. Well, so I'm going to do the best I can, then he'll clean it up. So basically, you know, we, we have a, a group practice in southwest part of Virginia. Um, in the mountains, if you look at the state, it's got this hook, and we're in the mountains. Anybody's heard of Virginia Tech? That's our home office. Uh, we have uh, nine offices. Uh, at one point, we had 13. Um, and when there were some changes in healthcare, we decided we needed to rethink the model in which private practice was done. And so we ended up looking at, is there a better model that is not just sustainable in today's healthcare, but providing our patients need. And what we found was, it was a lot of it was centered around access, patient access, and a lot of it surrounded the type of care and ultimately conversations and, and, and being their advocate through the process. Um, in about, I guess it was about seven years ago, uh, we brought in uh, someone to do a full evaluation on our company. And, and what are important, uh, goal that we wanted through that is what was the per, what, what was the perception? Uh, what what did people in the communities think? What did our doctors think? What did other doctors think? And mostly, what did our patients think? And and so when she she came in, she um, she she did an extensive. Uh, it was what I call a qualitative review. So it wasn't a bunch of surveys. It was a lot of conversation. It took her about eight months, um, and 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 literally hours of of, of interview. And what she came out of it was that patients want to, literally, they want to be educated, they wanted to be respected, uh, at what we would call a more consumerized healthcare. Uh, what, what I later found out is what she described was called patient-centered care. Uh, what, what she described was is that our patients wanted us to do something called shared decision-making, uh, where we sat down with our patients and we had that discussion with them about what their care options are, maybe what the costs even were, so that they could be in charge of what direction to best take their care. Um, and mostly what they wanted was an advocate, someone that can help them when they've got an issue that they wanted to, to, to be resolved. Um, sometimes it was pain, uh, sometimes it was a better way of life, it, but, but the important thing was is every patient had a different goal when they came in. Now, we had at that time about 16 doctors, and the question is, is how do you take 16 independent-minded doctors and turn it into a, consi a consistent experience amongst our group? Because that was a big thing uh, that we needed to look at. So that's what we went to, 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 to do. And we literally uh, about, uh, we, we sat down after we got this information, realized it was time that we needed to rethink everything. We rethought how we talked to our patients. We rethought how about how we told who we are and what we did. And mostly we thought about what did a great doctor look like? And so that's where we're going to talk a little bit about today is how we not just defined it, but then we measured it. And then we provided that feedback for our doctors so that they could continuously improve as well. And so that's who we are. It's a group of doctors. We like to think like-minded doctors uh, that we were able to do what we call scale and quality care uh, in a chiropractic group. Um, and a lot of people have done it in other areas, but chiropractic is, is we're an independent minded group. And so being able to do this, we thought would be a, a, a challenge that not only would benefit our patients, uh, but our employees um, and, and, and also our doctors and hopefully look towards the future of how we can better provide great care. So with that being said, we'll let you continue on. Sorry. We're going to talk about what is patient centered care? 
So I mentioned a few minutes ago about this, this uh, individual that did what we called a perception study in truth that was a branding evaluation. Um, but we decided to call it a perception because for us it was more about what did they perceive. And what we found was is it was driven by their choices, consumerism. Now, that doesn't mean patients are just, you know, flippantly saying, hey, I want one visit here and not that. No, it was they wanted to be educated. Uh, what they, they wanted to have their options. They wanted to know what, what uh, success rates were um, and, and what they weren't. Um, it was about meeting their goals on their terms. Uh, the term that, that she taught us was patients are the CEO of their healthcare team. And we love that. It's a great visual because all of us are CEOs of our own healthcare team. And on my healthcare team, I have a dentist, I have a primary care doctor, I have a chiropractor. I have friends that are PTs. They're not directly treating me, but they are a, a reference or an advocate for me when I need them. And that's my team. And what do I want with my CEO team or my healthcare team? I want them to get along. I want them to work together. I want them to be focused on my goals. And just like any company would have a CEO, that's what we found patients were, was very important to them. And lastly, is care, uh, they wanted their care to be effective and efficient. Um, unfortunately, sometimes with the lack of consistency, it made it very difficult to find out whether this particular type of care was the most successful versus this one. We all have experienced the different techniques that are out there, and there's a lot of concepts about what this better or that better, but we wanted the data to tell us what was better. And so we wanted to start tracking our data as well so that we could provide better information and ultimately better care for those patients. But I think the biggest take home message for me when it comes to patient centered care, and I'm gonna challenge you guys to think about this too, and that is what do you want when you're a patient? We've all been a patient at one time or another. And I gotta tell you, when I go see my dentist, I don't wanna be told I have to have this. What I wanna know is, is I have an option. I can get a crown. I could not get a crown, deal with a sensitive tooth and take a chance of it cracking. Or I could go ahead and get the crown. I could get the best crown in the world or I could get the crown that's gonna last for 10 years. And I wanna know what those results are and I wanna be able to make those decisions. And by the way, I even wanna know how much it's gonna cost. And I think that that's a, a current transparency. And I challenge all of you guys, especially you students, when you're in practice and you have that patient come in and you remember, we have something we call the platinum rule in our group. And one of our partners, other partners, uh, taught us this. And it's not about, everybody knows the golden rule, right? What's the golden rule? Do, come on, somebody say it for me. Save me. Do on to others. Yeah. Yeah. She did. She did. The platinum rule is do on to others as they would like to do, right? So it's not about what I would want because a patient doesn't have the same experience that I have. They want to be educated. They want, so it's about them. It's about the platinum rule. And so I challenge you guys, especially your students, when you go in there and you have those patients, think about it from that perspective. They want you to help them serve them. The technique requirement that we have based on the platinum rule with all of our doctors is the F and H technique. And that stands for flexibility and humility. Uh, knowing when to do um, a, a different type of treatment based on the patient's needs. It, it might not be the, the absolute gold standard adjustment they need or treatment care plan they need, but knowing when to swap that up so that you can help them in the best way that they're allowing you to is, is extremely flexible. Knowing when you're not getting that patient better and it's time to co-manage or to, to do a straight referral out, there's the humility part. Um, it takes a very strong person to say, hey, you know, I've done all I can do, and, and Dr. So-and-so down the street is going to do a better job going forward to meet your goals. Um, so what are options in today's chiropractic world? How can we practice? Uh, there's, there's quite a few different ways. We've, we've discussed some of those on this trip, Dr. Tuck, and, and I um, fit into the second um, bullet point that I'll expand on there shortly, but uh, solo practitioner. Is, is historically the, the way that most chiropractors have gone out and hung up their shingle um, and saved lives. Um, that, is, that is definitely a viable option. I think as we see, and Dr. Tuck sits on a regulatory board in the state of Virginia, he sees a lot of physician burnout due to the demands that are put on the providers. 
you're not just a doctor. You have to be a coding specialist. You have to be able to talk people off the edge because, you know, whatever they've got going on, you have to manage your team. You have to be your marketing guru. You have to uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable. You, you really have about 13 hats that you wear as a solo practitioner. Uh, and in chiropractic, we're seeing a, a very, very high rate of burnout. Um, if the doctor's not burning out, then something might be falling through the cracks. They're opening themselves up for audits or lawsuits or what have you. So um, we've opted not to, to practice as a solo practitioner because quite honestly, we, we like getting adjusted as well. And it's a lot easier to appreciate and, and like the guy down the road in a clinic that's working with you as opposed to the enemy um, that historically we've seen other chiropractors on our street be. Um, we chose the group practice model, which I'll divulge into here in a few minutes. But there's other models as well that are really, I mean, really quickly coming to the forefront of a lot of chiropractors' minds. Young, sharp students like uh, Logan makes here. Um, the, the integrative practice model. I've, I've got a couple um, examples up there. Uh, Drs. Graham and, and Weingart out at the Oregon, Oregon Health Science University are doing a phenomenal job in the, the chronic pain uh, management, musculoskeletal, chronic musculoskeletal pain department there. Um, we, we were, Dr. Bona and I were chatting earlier about the, the measurements, the, the historical measurements of a successful practice being patient visits, be it, it revenue driven, um, you know, retention, PVA, these type words that we've used. Dr. Graham, she, she got real scared when she got into this integrated setting because she was not seeing the volume of patients that she normally would have seen in the solo practice. But that's okay because she and her team have dropped the cost of healthcare 40 some percent in a few short years uh, for those musculoskeletal issues. Uh, Dr. Anthony Lisi as well um, in the veteran, uh, what does that stand for? VHA? Veterans Health Administration. Dr. Lisi is, is actively fighting to get chiropractors into the VA system. Logan participates in the VA here as well. So again, integrating chiropractors into a larger healthcare setting um, is really showing how we shine. Um, the other one being a multidisciplinary practice. There's a little bit of a difference between integrated and multidisciplinary. Um, one of, one of our, our friends that we've gotten to know um, Dr. Devin Williams is, is out of Dell Medical out at uh, U University of Texas in Austin um, where there is literally a team that's built around the patient to assess the needs of the patient, the efficacy of the types of care, and, and when we get very clearly defined what this patient has, we put them on that pathway with the proper um, provider that gives everybody else feedback immediately, and it's done in a beautiful multidisciplinary way. They've able to, to take and, and bring to the inception a value-based model that is turning a lot of heads in healthcare, and it was all started by chiropractic care. Uh, there's two chiropractors on that team. Um, so so there's the, the possibilities are endless, again, um, going forward in the future of healthcare. Um, this is a one sheet. So, so this is a, a model that I've, I've had Dr. Tuck help develop so that we can do patient education, we can do um, doctor education, staff education, public education. Um, it's, just, it's just kind of a one-stop shop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to this as our model, if you will, and I'm going to break down each of these, these different areas and explain them in depth a little bit. Um, so if you have any questions, this, this is kind of the, the big middle part, if you will. Um, I, can, I can pull this back up if you have any questions. Um, just, just kind of jot them down and we'll get back to this. So. We start patients in episodic care based on crisis or elective care modules. So a crisis care, an episodic care model has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There we go. Um, the patient comes in having experienced a mechanism of injury. They've lost a functional deficit. They show up in our chiropractic office and we do our assessments, we, we decide you'd be a great chiropractic candidate, let's do a trial of care. We follow the guidelines that we've laid out for our, our doctors um, and, and return, I don't know if you can see this, return the patient through these guidelines to a regaining of their function or get them as far along that journey as possible. When they regain function, come back to 
um, you know, pre-injury status, if you will, we take pause, have a conversation with the patient that delineates a different type of care should they choose to go forward, called elective care. It's also referred to as maintenance care or wellness care. There's, there's quite a few um, interchangeable names. We call it elective care because the patient elects to go through that as a part of their self-management. Um, part of that delineation, part of the end of their episodic care, that conversation going forward is one that is as much as you appreciate just paying your copay, your insurance does not cover the type of care we're fixing to move into, which is elective care. So it's kind of like you, everybody here that has a car probably has insurance on that car. Your car insurance does not pay for tire rotations, oil changes, and the like. It's probably a good idea to do those, but the expense falls to you as the car owner. Much like our health insurance, even though we're paying for that health insurance, it, it covers us when we need to be rebuilt. So if we lock the engine up on our car in a, in a wreck or a fender bender or what have you, insurance will cover to get it back to functional status. And then you, as the, the consumer, the owner of the car, take over the, the maintenance of it. Same thing with our health insurance. John Q. Public does not understand what they're purchasing in their health insurance. So there's, a, there's an amount of um, trust that they have in us when we can clearly explain what they're really getting into and why certain types are covered and why they're not. Um, if the patient decides they want to undergo this elective care, that's a part of their, their self-management between episodes. We know that musculoskeletal-based spinal pain is episodic in nature. If it goes untreated, it happens more frequently and more severely as time goes on. So, you know, we get them as good as we can. We draw that line and say, hey, remember to do ice and heat. Remember to do your stretches and your stability exercises. If anything goes awry, please call us again and we'll, we'll get you out of the woods again. We also, if you want to try and maintain it through chiropractic care, we're phenomenal, you know, maintenance-based. Um, we have a phenomenal maintenance-based practice as well. So, again, one foot astride that line cash versus insurance. It, 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 we, we've kind of figured out a way where it can neatly be done. Here is where I will very shamelessly promote an ACA upcoming webinar. Um, Dr. Jennifer Brathman and I were asked by, by the ACA to put together a, a fairly basic training, if you will, on what an episode of care looks like through the Medicare, um, the Medicare uh, webinar series. How do you clearly define the beginning of an episode of care? It's pretty easy if the patient's never been to the office. They show up and say, hey, I hurt. Um, there's a middle of care. There's certain criteria and bullets and boxes to check, if you will, through the middle of care. Then there needs to be an end to the episode of care, uh, wrapping things up in a nice, neat little package. That's where being a doctor comes in you get to decide what it is. Now there's guidelines on how to, how to delineate these different types, or excuse me, different processes of care, but um, Dr. Rathman and I have been uh, asked to kind of lay that out in a webinar series. So keep your eyes out for that. ACA members, uh, SACA um, students, will we'll do our best to get that um, shifted around to you guys as well, as well. So back to that. When you defined and decided the types of care you can take care of. The next part is going into the type of practice that you build around the patient experience. They're either having a crisis or an elective experience in your, in your clinic system. Well, how do, you, how do you set that up for sustainability over a longer period of time? Historically, in a, in a solo practice, these are the two ends of the spectrum, if you will, and it's more of a cycle. I've, I've tried to show that with my principal six, my time arrows. Um, so, y'all do have green books here at Logan. I saw one earlier today. Um, when you start into practice and you're in this growth mode, most of the patients that show up on your doorstep are in the acute or the episodic nature. So, that I, I picture this as a funnel. You know, most of the people that come in are in some form of crisis care, um, and you treat those patients. As you mature, as time goes on, you bounce into a more mature type practice, a more um, wellness or maintenance based. Dr. Evans was, was pointing out she goes home every other weekend to Springfield to, to, she said it was very humbling, and it is. When you have a following of patients that 
continue to come back 12 and a half years later to, to pay out of pocket to be seen. That's very humbling as, as a chiropractor, but it also means that you're a more mature practitioner. Um, when you become a more mature practitioner, you have less time to, to focus on the acute type uh, patients. If you don't, they kind of go somewhere else. And over time, again, you'll have some attrition in this wellness or maintenance type elective care model that, that props up the base of your um, mature practice. When that happens, one chiropractor in, uh, near us, about every three to four years, will roll out that big vinyl sign and stick it in the front yard uh, that says, now accepting new patients. And they, they, they revert back to a growth model um, of solo practitioner. That can be very frustrating especially as you get further into to practice, you're gonna to have to dust off you know, the old model of, of marketing and, and spinal health classes and the stuff that you've kind of gotten away from as a mature practitioner, and you've gotta get that stuff back out. Um, and then, you know, again, with everything else being heaped on top of, of the doctor and the provider, um, there's burnout can happen fairly quick during that having to go back into a regrowth mode. Um, so what we decided to do is use what we refer to lovingly as collective power. What better idea than to take a doctor in the mature phase, pair them up with a doctor in the growth phase under one overhead, for lack of a better term, um, a business decision here as well, pair them up so that the mature doctor can offer guidance and mentorship to a younger doctor much like the preceptor program that Logan's doing a phenomenal job with. Uh, there he is. Um, why, why can't that work? Not, why can't that work past the preceptor phase? Um, let's try it. So we did. We combined several of our clinics um, fiscally, made great sense. One overhead versus two. Patient care wise, made really, really good sense after we got into it and realized, you know, that, wow. Miss Jones always wanted a female practitioner, but Dr. X was male. Now you have a male and female, she can go with her husband to get adjusted, and guess what? You're serving more of the population. More goals are being met in-house. You know there's a high quality care going on. We'll talk about how we know that here shortly, but it just made really, really good sense. I worked hand in hand with our, our HR director on recruiting both of staff and on our doctor side, and the majority of students and young practitioners that we interview want mentorship. So there, there's another bird we can kill with that stone. Um, a nod, a tip of the hat, if you will, to Logan. The golden peach. Anybody recognize that? Does anybody know what the golden peach is? I was, I was educated last week, it was really neat. Logan Basic is an amazing technique. I've had it done several times. Um, you know, you don't get a lot of, I won't say that. Um, you, you're picked on occasionally, you brown thumbers, you. But it's awesome technique. Um, this, this trophy, I was told, is given to the student clinician that, you know, has done the greatest job of patient care or what have you. And again, I'm probably messing this up. But it is actually the hand of this young man, who some of you might recognize as having come out of Logan University in December of 2017. We stumbled across this young man in February of last year. He joined our clinic system, um, worked in one of our clinics for several months. There was an opening in my clinic, and lo and behold, he was able to, to slide into my clinic, um, and is now, you know, he, he runs my clinic. He saw patients today. He's going to see patients there tomorrow doing a phenomenal job. This is Dr. Tyler Garapola. Um, when I look at the, the phrase that I see under Logan on the pillars out here, it says leaders made. And I can truly tell you that this young man is the golden peach and a leader that Logan made. He's doing a phenomenal job. So if the caliber of, of practitioner coming out of here is like Tyler, we're, we're going to be back and do some recruiting on our next trip in. I will say that I was a little bit nervous um, first time I had Tyler adjust me based on the golden peach thing. You know, he, he said, okay, doc, let's get you adjusted. And he pulls out a latex glove and my eyes got big. He said, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So 
I hope he's watching this and that embarrassed him good. He doesn't have the uh, the cute little baby face anymore. I made him grow a beard because, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. I love it. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, again, an, an ode to, to Logan. I've done a heck of a job um, and with this young man and, and a lot of the, the SACA people that are students that we've met are, are phenomenal individuals as well. So thank you all. Back to this. Where are we at? So this type of practice, we've, we've delineated types of care. We've built a practice model around that that allows that type of care to be clearly defined. We have these conversations with our patients. Um, we found out that this is a, what is the proper term? Um, it's not going to come to me. Anyway, this is exactly what comes out. This was the goal we set out to, to accomplish to start with, is having a, a patient-centered model. This is exactly what the, the type of practice model that we've, we've been building has allowed us to do. Keep the patient at the very center of the conversation about health. We made the statement earlier, excuse me, we made the statement earlier that the patient wants to be the CEO of their, of their health care team. This truly lets them be the, the, the quarterback, if you will, of that team and drive their health care to their goals. So, a little clinical aspect for you. This young lady came to see me four or five years ago. She'd been in and out of chiropractic care most of her, her teen and, and early 20 life, early 20s life, um, she had a pretty nasty little, little hook going on down there in the thoracolumbar region. Um, we treated her through several episodes of care. She'd get great relief. She came back in a couple, probably, probably about 18 months ago now, um, having a, a pretty bad flare. Um, she had some markers through some, some blood testing that, you know, showed that she had some inflammatory processes going on as well. Um, we did the best we could for her, but her goals weren't quite met. So we put our heads together. I made a couple phone calls in the community um, with some, some providers, non-chiropractic providers who I've worked with very well over the years and said, hey, here's what we've got. Is it, give me some feedback. Do you have any suggestions? Would you like to, uh, to take this patient on and treat them? Um, so we made a referral to a pain management doctor who did a wonderful job for a couple months and then again kind of plateaued off and, and again goals weren't being met function still greatly um, um, limited we the pain management doc and I put our heads together and say what, what next what next the the route that was decided upon with the patient's input was one of surgery so we looked around and said hey where, where's the best surgeon for this you know through the grapevine of, of southwest Virginia which is pretty entangled. This young lady ended up going to North Carolina, down near Raleigh, um, and had this done. It's pretty pretty invasive, and I apologize for the quality. That was the, the facts that came in uh, to my office last week. As a one-year follow-up to her herring to rod surgery, that has allowed her to return to being a mom of a three-year-old, 29-year-old female now. Um, but her lower back, pelvic area, lumbo pelvic area, still hurts a little bit. I can imagine why. You know, nothing's moving above it. So, yeah, that's kind of your weakest link at that point. So very shortly, she's going to be coming back in. She, she's waiting for full release. I think it came last week um, from her surgeon to, to be released back into um, her carrying circle is what this surgeon referred to that outline the you know, patient-centered care ring that I had up there earlier. But when he, he faxed in, this is the one year, um, you're now one year out from your operation. We're going to see you back in a year. If you're having any issues, guess what? You, oops, sorry. You are the responsible party. That's where her name's supposed to be. You're the responsible party. Please touch base with your primary care practitioner, your chiropractor, number two on the list, your rheumatologist, your pain management, um, and call me surgeon if you need to. So I thought that very appropriate timing that, you know, here we want to have the patient at the center of the care and help them steer the ship, give the, the guidance that they need and be their advocates, and it, and it comes through my fax machine as a follow-up. So, kind of wrapped up my one sheet there. 
But I do want to touch on this. Dr. DeBono and, and Dr. Mercer, under, under Coppola? No, just one, Dr. Mercer. <laughs> Approached me at NCLC in March of last year after I came off the Choosing Wisely panel. I went on to that stage with a complete understanding that I knew very little about Choosing Wisely from an academic standpoint, from a research standpoint, but I knew and, and was asked to sit on that panel because I did it every day. Uh, about 18 months prior, my processor died on my x-ray machine. Dr. Tuck and I chatted and said, hey, look, we're trying to be a little bit more collaborative. Let's send them down. Your, your radiology buddy, who's the, who's the um, lacrosse coach for your kids, just send them over. You know, let him, let him do his job. So we did. We just worked out a deal with the local imaging center, send the folks out. Um, choosing wisely, we call it common sense. It's like, wow, I've been doing this for 18 months, didn't even know it. They asked me to come sit on the panel because they considered me the boots on the ground. I don't know what that meant. I do have boots, but uh, um, that common sense, it, it, it sent a ripple. The choosing wisely sent a ripple through the, the profession. We hate to be told what we cannot do. And the last bullet here says, this does not limit the scope of practice of the doctors in our practice. It, we call it common sense, but common sense apparently is now a superpower. So this is, choosing wisely was a, was a, a superpower. When you're in a very rural setting like we are, a lot of, with, with raising deductibles like Dr. Tuck mentioned, a lot of the cost of care falls on the patient. There's a shared decision making that has to happen in most of our uh, care recommendation conversations about, now, you could have a set of x-rays. You might, you don't have a whole lot of red flags for x-rays, and we might see something on there. But I think for the cost of a set of x-rays, we could do an entire week's worth of care to see how you respond. That leads to efficiency. The patients, most of the time, respond fairly well. If they don't, guess what? We can go get those x-rays now. You know, it's, it's an appropriate time to do that. If there's a big, big, ugly red flag waving at us, we're going to refer them anyway. So we didn't really get up in arms about the choosing wisely uh, that came through because of that shared decision making we had started doing with our patients. Um, we, we think it elevates the profession from an informed or an evidence informed standpoint. Um, if you're leaning on guidelines, choosing wisely is based on guidelines from my boots on the ground understanding of it. So I wanted to throw that in as it applies to this. Choosing wisely is a pretty important part to our healthcare group-based model. Um, I don't know the number, Dr. Tuck probably does. How many of our clinics, of the nine clinics we still have, um, x-ray machines? Exactly. Usable ones? Yeah, <laughs> touche. Um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of a no-brainer for us to, to kind of adopt the choosing wisely um, and implement that fully across the board. So I didn't want to touch on that. Um, this, this is what we call the chiropractic role in healthcare and how a group, group practice like ours has, has kind of built itself around that. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Tuck to kind of touch briefly on what a successful practice looks like. And with the Affordable Care Act, there's this big thing called the triple aim, again, with the, with the threes, and the triple aim the way we explain it is, you know, happy patients, effective care, healthier communities. We threw in happy employees in there as well because the metrics that we use to give ourselves feedback bring the people we serve into that conversation. Our goals are set up in parallel to parallel, or excuse me, are set up to parallel our patient goals and our employee goals. Um, happy employees make for a wonderful work environment. Unhappy employees affect a patient's experience in your office. Um, we had the opportunity to, to educate one of our younger doctors about the importance of a staff member um, and, and how imperative they are in a patient's experience a couple weeks ago, and it was very eye-opening. I said, you don't want to have an unhappy staff because they will sabotage your patient care, whether consciously or un unconsciously. It, it just kind of happens. We've, we've seen it happen a few times. Um, so we want to make sure our employees are kept as happy as possible um, because it just makes more fun working with happy people. 
how do you ensure that? Though? How do you ensure that your triple aim or your, your meeting um, employee and, and, and most importantly patient um, expectations um, and increasing the health of your community while at the same time being viable? You have to align the measurements of this feedback with those you're serving. You identify aspects that you can improve on. When you've identified them, you train on them. Then you give feedback on them, and you set up this continuous improvement loop where if something's not as good as it should be, we're going to work to improve that for the sake of the patient. And considering that information, again, will drive you down the path to true patient-centered care where their goals are being met, that they're being extremely happy, um, and, and we're seeing more patients. After our branding study, Dr. Tuck knows the stats on this, after our branding study, and Nina, I don't think Nina's here, but she asked a great question. She said, how do, you, how, do you, how do you know how your branding study and how do you know how the implementation of this new, new model that you've, you know, you, this new brand that you've built, how do you know it's working? How many, what was the percentage of new patients? So over an 18-month period of time, we saw about a 65% increase in new patient acquisition. Uh, and, and we consider it directly an approach of, of they knew what they were going to get when they came in our office. Uh, they were, it was very clear uh, what they were going to get was a consistent, evidence-based, great conversation. And even we were shocked we were, of the positive we shocked. response in the communities by that. And it continues. In fact, our biggest issue now is capacity, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. because having enough doctors to handle those type of things and maintain quality care, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is a challenge. So... Those few minutes are here. Um, oh, there we go. So, so you know, we mentioned earlier again the, the you know the feedback we got, and and what we really found out was patients want a great experience. Uh, they want to make sure they're getting uh, great quality care. Uh, what do we want? You know, we wanted to make sure that we were able to keep the lights on, be able to adequately comp our our, our doctors and our staff. Uh, and, and have a great work environment for our employees. And so we went down this rabbit hole, if you will, of how do you figure out whether you have a great doctor or not? Because I was asked that question, and I'm like, I don't know. I mean, they're a good doctor because they have a big practice. And I thought, well, is that really the answer? And so it took us down a journey for the last probably four years that we have now centered up into one slide, crazy enough, <laughs> called our KPI, or Key Performance Indicators, in our practices. Um, we broke them into three things, and, and I'll just be square with you. It's so simple, you're going to be shocked. It's number one, how happy is a patient with the experience that they came into our office? Number two, was the doctor following a set quality, defined quality of care metric? And we'll I'll talk to you briefly about how we did that. And the last one is financially sustainable. Is the practice able to sustain the care it wants, wants to, you know, that it needs to provide to be able to continue to provide quality care for the communities? And so we broke it up into three KPIs. And so briefly, and I'm not trying not to spend too much time with this, when it came to patient satisfaction, um, uh, some of you may have heard of something called HCAPs. Raise your hand if you've heard of age caps or caps surveys. So cap surveys, for, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, they're basically, it was a, a national uh, survey uh, that was created uh, with the primary goal of reimbursing uh, doctors at a higher rate if they had happier patients. Um, and it's 33 questions. Um, some would tell you, and I can't argue with them, that actually the opioid epidemic was a part of this CAP survey because one of the key questions is, did the doctor control your pain? And of course, the doctors quickly said, if I control their pain, then I get paid more. So they immediately started providing the patients what they thought the patient wanted, which was an opioid at the time. And it's not their fault. It's just that was what they were told at the time. And so in theory, they say that's where policy actually was a part of the epidemic uh, cause or the cause of the epidemic we're now dealing with today. So 
This CAP survey was 33 questions, so we were all excited. I reached out to the researcher at the RAND group, um, uh, Ian Coulter to be specific, and, and he was gracious enough to kind of teach me. We, we, we brought in a, a consultant from North Carolina who helped us create a chiropractic uh, CAPS survey. It was 33 questions. We had the patients called, and the biggest feedback we got was, is I hate you for wasting my time asking these 33 questions. And it, you know, you th and I remember I'm thinking, well, I just want to know how we're doing. And then I filled out a survey that was about 35 or 40 questions, and I understood why our patients were so upset. Um, so then we asked ourselves, you know what, what are the questions? Of these questions, which ones can we take action on? So these are questions, we only want data that our doctors can take that information and improve on the care they were given their patients directly. And so we centered it down to five questions plus an open-ended question. Um, and I'll bore you real quickly. It was, the interesting question was, is what did they perceive they came in with? Which by the way is always very different than the diagnosis uh, that the doctor gave them. Um, we asked them, did the doctor explain all the care options to them? We asked them how well they responded to care. Um, and then um, uh, we asked them, uh, oh yeah, right on the hot seat and I forgot the fourth question. Bam. Um, can you help me? Nope. Okay, I <laughs> see how that works. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, were you overall satisfied with your experience? What was your satisfaction? And then we ask a net promoter score. Ever, yeah, that's a pretty much a standard in all kind of stuff. Uh, by the way, Apple has a net promoter score of about 60 some percent. Our net promoter score, and by the way, we're pretty consistent with the rest of chiropractic, is runs in the 93 to 95% as a net promoter. And by the way, that is fairly consistent with all chiropractors who measure it. So I wish we could say we were, but I think that's a testament to us as a profession. So then we use that information to go back to the doctors and, and, and we, we do an average of the company, we do each individual doctor, and that way we can start giving them some very important feedback. Our clinical outcomes are our, our clinical, what we call clinical quality reviews. Um, we update, just updated it again for this year. Uh, every year we look at the data or the evidence that's out there. We look at the guidelines. Uh, the guidelines that we primarily focused on was CCGPP, also known as Clinical Compass now. Uh, but we, the Canadians also have a great uh, a guidelines initiative too called CC, CCGI. Um, and, and both groups pretty much have come up with a pretty clear understanding of what quality care looks like based on the, the, the current data in terms of care delivery, modalities, and in some cases even what we call dosage or frequency of visits or, or what have you, which I have actually found to be the biggest challenge in, in, in some of our young doctors that join our group is how often do you treat a patient? Um, so we actually come up with 15 measures, and it's everything from how do they code it, to how they document it, did they follow the guidelines, to um, uh, what were their working, you know, was a working diagnosis appropriately documented, uh, did they appropriately respect the beginning, middle, and end of care, as Lee was commenting. In other words, were they re appropriately uh, released from care when the if episode was either resolved or referred out? And so these are 15 measures that we look at, including outcomes, by the way. We just added the PEG uh, assessment, so we can look at uh, that as well. And we rate the doctor. And so we do it every month. We give them feedback. We knew it was working because we had a doctor short, and our doctor that was doing it had to go see patients for about two months. And then we went back and did it. And it, without providing that feedback to our doctors, it dropped by like 5%. And as soon as we gave it back to them, it went right up to where, and our goal as a company is over 90% in terms of their quality. Um, that allows us all to work together, um, but the big thing we're proud of is, is that, it, that we have a certain standard uh, in, in our group um, that, that we can, can follow. I was sitting in a, a meeting just, gosh, three, four weeks ago um, and uh, with some carriers. It was a specific carrier um, that uh, they, they got to asking what we did in our group, and I said something about quality metrics. And they said, well, it seems like that's what we need. Can we borrow your quality metrics? This is a carrier. And I said, actually, I don't think so. I, I, I prefer not sure I'm with you. Uh, uh, but what I would challenge you as a carrier is to define what those quality metrics are for us 
and this I was there as ACA president, and I said, let's then take that information, train our doctors on what that would look like, and let us also help you train your reviewers so we're all working together so that patients can get good quality care, and we all understand what that is defined as and, and, and what it looks like. And, uh, and, and I will tell you, and you should know, um, there, was, uh, there was myself, and, one, and uh, I was the only chiropractor there with ACA. However, there was a chiropractor with one of the, the groups that was an uh, administrator group, and there was two PTs, one from this major carrier and one from the administrator group. And all of them were like, oh, we're not leaving until we have a follow-up step. They wanted to help define that. And that actually, for the first time, I couldn't believe it. They were like, you know, we were trying to get out because I was like, man, I, I, that was far beyond I ever thought. And that's exciting. And, and I think that that's another great testament to the secrets out. And if we have a set way of telling these great doctors, the carriers are going to embrace this. And, uh, and, but we do got to come up with what quality looks like. And so hopefully uh, that will continue to be an initiative that the ACA pursues and, and, and grows upon, and I think it will be. The last thing is let's talk about financial sustainability. It's, it's, a, it's the tough reality in the room, but it is a business. Um, we, we, we own uh, uh, nine uh, clinics in our group. Um, and, and when you have one clinic that is not able to sustain itself, the other clinics have to make up that difference. Um, and, and so the, the reality is, is that we want to give our doctors every bit of success we can so that they can be successful and they have to do it on their end as well. And that, and, and again, just like we talked about the clinical quality, we've talked about this as well, but there's a there's a uh, the, the, there's a book that was written. It's called The Great Game of Business. A friend of mine that runs a very large transportation company told me about it, and it's called Open Book Management or Transparency in the Finances. And we started embracing that in our group in our individual clinics, and we found by doing that, our doctors and ultimately our staff. And us, we're now partners in the process of the success of the practice, as opposed to they want something, we say no, and it ends up being a tug of war at the end of the day. Now we work together, and, and, and they get to benefit from the upside. They also realize that there's downsides to it, and that's going to have impl impl uh, implications as well. Um, and, and by us working with them, we have found that we had, at one time, um, probably a third of our clinics were knocking it out of the park, a third of them were doing okay, and a third of them were really kind of having a tough time. And within six months, when we started sharing this information, all the clinics were sustainable in their own right. And, and so we felt good because the ones that were being successful in honoring the, we call them guardrails, of our patient's experience and our clinical quality, and by the way, what's really interesting, I brought an outside consultant in from the finance world, and he asked to see this, this, this dashboard that we provide every, we actually provide it every quarter, but we update them every month. He said, I would have never guessed that your high quality doctors and happy experience were also your most financially successful clinics. He said, I would have thought you would have sacrificed financial success with quality. He said, I'm shocked. And I said, I'm not, because that's what happens. Um, uh, Lee mentioned something about Dell Medical. Well, I've had the pleasure of getting to know a lot of the, 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 the groups down there. And one of the lines that uh, she actually wrote the book on value-based care, her name, uh, she did it with, uh, his name is Mike, uh, his name is Leaving Me, and then Elizabeth Peasberg is, is the second author. And she said a lot of people in today's world are assuming that you get to choose between volume or value. But she said, I actually think it's different. She said, I think you embrace value and you're gonna find that it drives volume, but you gotta respect the value first. And unfortunately, too many people go right to volume and they miss, they, they sacrifice the value or the, the quality of the experience. And we can tell you through our data, that 65% that, that I brought up, we're seeing it happen. Um, in fact, one of our other partners, Jen Rathman, is pulling that data together to provide to the value 
Healthcare Institute at Dell so that they can, because they're, they're starting to take this data from all over the country and, 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 and show that when you embrace value, you actually get to see an improved bottom line. You get to see an improved top line because patients are happy and, and that grows too. Um, but I think the, 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 the quiet uh, thing that, that, that sometimes we forget about is, and this is another dirty secret in the room, and that is that physician burnout right now in healthcare is at an all-time high. It's a sad reality, but doctors are burnt out. Chiropractors are no different. We're just as equal as they are. They're, they're, uh, unfortunately, a sad statistic, uh, there is a statistic that says that a doctor has twice the chance of suicide than their patients that they're seeing. I mean, that's where you're at right now with physician burnout. And people are, you know, and, and, and all the data markers are point to it's a tough time in this world. But what they have found is, is when organizations are focusing on value, all of a sudden their own you know, their burnout starts to reduce or their own quality goes up and they feel good about the care they're given because it's why they went to school. They want to be caregivers. They want to do these things. And so when they started, when the organization started embracing a great quality patient-centered care, that, 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 that burnout started reducing. All of a sudden, they got their center again on what they want to do. And then they also started uh, seeing some very positive changes as a, from a business standpoint, and it feels good. And I can tell you from our standpoint, we had staff turnover that was out off the charts. We had doctors that were very unhappy. And I got to tell you, when you look at those now, our turnover and our clinic staff is, is very low. Uh, patients are very high, our, our patients are very happy, our staff's very happy, and our doctors are very happy because they know what they are being measured on, um, and they're getting that constant feedback all the time. We have what, a, what we went ahead and did uh, for, for BJ, for the philosophy uh, gurus in the room, is we, we kind of embrace the new big idea, and all else is following. Um, so again, you can stand on both sides of that fence if you want to. Kind of, kind of wrapping this up, um, we've been up here yakking for a lot. We do want to leave some time for some conversation, like we said earlier. We are the OG patient-centered providers, period. Doing it right since 1895. And the rest of the world's finally catching up. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's, let's rope this hog and ride it. Uh, you know, just <laughs> another one of them one-liners. Um, again, the ACA and Logan are doing phenomenal jobs um, to, to get chiropractic where the puck's going to be, moving in the direction of where the future of healthcare is going. Those two entities, the ACA from an organization and Logan from, a, um, from an academic standpoint, are doing, a, doing an amazing job. So we're thrilled to death to be here uh, to hopefully add some value to that uh, for both organizations. Um, delineation of care types are imperative. You've got to know what type of patient care you're giving to what patient at, at, at any time, um, following through with the coding, the documentation. There are multiple settings. Again, the sky's the limit with that as, as time progresses and technology catches up and all that fancy stuff. Um, patients drive it. If, if you keep the main thing the main thing and, and center your practice style around your patients, um, you, you're and let them drive their healthcare choices, you're going to be very successful as a chiropractor. Um, chiropractic is, is positioned to be one of the key elements in, in care delivery. Um, we, we're seeing that left and right, um, and truly now is the greatest time in history to be a chiropractor. So um, we really appreciate y'all having us. We, yeah. we do open it up at this point. Any questions that uh, you might have? And, 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 we do, and we do love questions. So, we, we, in fact, after choosing wisely, man, I'm ready. <laughs> Teed up, ready to go. So. No, seriously, what questions do you guys have? We, we, we'd love to, you know, I'm sure some of this, or maybe even if it's not a part of this, we'd love to hear your, your questions and see if there's something that we can do to add a unique perspective to it. Go ahead. Yes, sir. In a patient-centered care model, uh, if you have a patient that doesn't care about their health as much, um, we often 
are told as students, you know, whenever a doctor cares about the patient's health more than the patient does, um, how do you how do you approach that patient? Well, you know, that's that's a great question, and, and it's tough, right? Because we know what they don't know, and 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 so I think there is a a key component to to, to the reality that you've got to do your best you can to educate them, you know, or share with them. Um, in some cases, and it's a sad reality, a lot of the other consumerism stuff out there is working against what we would consider a healthy lifestyle. And so I suggest in, in our group or what we tell our doctors is you got to go where the patient is. For example, I had a patient uh, a couple years ago. Um, she was sitting there and she was had fibromyalgia. She had chronic low back pain and she just goes down the whole list. And I just happened to notice she had a one liter bottle of Mountain Dew. And so I couldn't help myself. I said, so ma'am, I said, uh, how many of those do you drink a day? She said, four. So I'm thinking to myself, four, you know, that's a, that's, that's a fair amount, you know. And so I, I knew better than to say, hey, go to water, right? You know, I mean, that's not going to happen. So I said, hey, how about we make a deal? What if you were to just change one of those to water a day? And so I tried to work on her terms because she needed it to get through the day, whether it be uh, a true caffeine and sugar or whether, you know, dependency or whether it was a, a, a you know, more of a, 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 a lenience on that. I needed to get through the day, you know, from a social or, you know, I need this kind of uh, perspective. Um, uh, but, you know, that it, I, I wanted to go to where, they, where she was and, and kind of take it from there because I'm convinced that, and I did it too. When I got out of school, I thought every human being should run like a Ferrari, right? But I realized not everybody wants to run like a Ferrari. Some people just want to get back out on the field. Um, and, and so I think that's why that conversation and, and kind of kind of getting them to share a little bit with what their goals are. Because um, the day that you try to give optimal health and wellness to a patient that says, look, it hurts when I sit at work and I just want to be able to go to work and not hurt, then you build that trust. Uh, I heard this one line I thought was great, land and expand. You know, let's land there. Let's build a trusting relationship with that patient and then allow them to go to the, why does it keep coming back? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. And that's where, you know, it could, and then it can stem from there. But it's about building that trust. The sad reality is sometimes to make life simpler, we want to kind of make every patient the same. But every patient is different, and they expect that, and we need to make sure we respect that. Um, so hopefully that, that helps a little bit and, with that. And our, our good buddy, A.J. LaBarbera, who's, who's one of our senior partners as well, says that we need to be the perfect doctor for the patient in right. front of us. We do not need to stand there and, and market to or expect the perfect patient to walk across the threshold every time a patient walks across the threshold. Those are very unrealistic expectations. But going back to that, that slide with the patient's post-op x-rays, they ultimately are the responsible party of their health. The, the, the Affordable Care Act dumped the public's health in their lap. That's a multi-generational thought process changing type thing to do when all of a sudden, oh, they've covered everything for, for years. Well, guess what? If you smoke, if you're overweight, if you made poor lifestyle decisions, you're gonna suffer not just from a healthcare standpoint or, or a health standpoint down the road, you're going to suffer monetarily because they're going to start cutting that stuff out. Well, if you smoke, then you're going to be at a higher tier. You're going to pay higher premiums. Um, it, it's kind of like the life insurance world. I can fully see the day where you are vetted as a client of a healthcare insurance company based on your life decisions up to that point. Certain things you can't really, I mean, there's an accident or a genetic predisposition, but if you smoke, if you don't exercise, you know, if you, they're, they're, they're really can, I, I can see it move in that direction, should they want to, over time. Um, so having the patient understand that is hard. You, you first, you don't want to take hope away from a patient at all. Uh, I think Fred Barge said that. Never remove a patient's hope, but do draw the line at how much responsibility you can take. Um, you, you, you can give 100%. They're going to have to give 100% as well in order for their goals to be met. So, good question. Yes, sir. Well, as a student, 
that's halfway through their program right now, um, the biggest thought that I always have is like, how do I get a mentor? So what can I do as a student now to prepare myself so that I look appealing to docs like yourselves in order when I get done that you're willing to take on uh, a mentorship role uh, for me sure. as a student? <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, it's a great question because I've been in your shoes. I mean, you know, and I think um, one of the things that uh, is really challenging for us sometimes is the uh, uh, fact that ACA did this um, interview process and, and, and our HR person and, and Dr. Rathman uh, were, were part of that at, at the last NCLC and they asked me to review the, 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 the documents and I said the one and they said they had do's and don'ts of an interview and I, I asked them to add one don't and this may help with that. Don't tell me how to run my practice when you're in, when I'm interviewing you. Now it doesn't mean that you're not right. It's just it's just a really strange dynamic in that that sense, and I, so I think being a willing learner, being a willing to, to you know, there, there's a certain amount of humility that I think one needs to be a good caregiver in today's world, and we look for that, and and we're willing. The interesting thing is, we will go to the ends of the earth for one of our doctors or staff as long as we feel like. They're a partner with us. Mm -hmm. But the day, I think, you know, you said there's a day when a doctor should never worry more about, you know. Well, when, when we want something more than, than a young doctor may want or even a, a support staff, a, you know, team member, um, then we start losing. We, we think where can we invest our time? So I think the main thing is is a certain level of humility, openness, ask questions. Um, at at the, the, the talk we did today, I kind of did a closing uh, a, a, plea for the doctors that they may work for one day, I said, have a little empathy on the doctor, because I can tell you, I graduated 20 some years ago now, and I learned a very different lesson than you guys are, and I've tried to keep up with it. Uh, I would like to think I've done a little better than the average pup, but I can tell you there's a lot I don't know, and, 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 and I really... I need help too, you know, so be patient with me uh, when, you know, because they were going over stuff in coding that I can tell you with firsthand experience, doctors in the field don't know. And they don't not know it because they're being obstinate or because they're being mean or they're trying to fraud the system. They genuinely don't know. Now, we think at the ACA, put my ACA hat on for a second, that that's an opportunity for us. You know, that's an opportunity for us to help our members and, and not just where's the puck going, but also how can they be successful in today's world while we're continuing to push our advocacy efforts such as, you know, uh, TRICARE or Medicare equality and, 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 and any other of uh, those type of advocacy efforts. But what, what can we do tomorrow, help our doctors tomorrow? And so it, it's a, it's, it's a, it takes, they say it takes a, a, a village to raise a child, you know, and I think it's, it's all of us. We got to work together. And so I think that's a, the main thing. I will tell you the biggest thing we look for is teamwork. If they are a good teamwork oriented person, that's what we want. Yeah. So F flexibility and humility. Yeah. You know, the, the humility to come forth and say, I want a mentor. I don't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel or make the same mistakes that you made. Um, I'm extremely flexible for me to be able to offer my strengths as a, as a you know, a, a incoming doctor, so to speak. I'm, I'm very flexible on where my strengths can be, you know, best used. Where do you see it? You know, so those, those two things just, again, repeat. I use that all the time through our recruiting stuff. Um, and it's very easy to see who a good candidate to be a team member of ours would be based on those two things, those two criteria um, have set a lot of people aside from our interview process. Um, so yeah, you guys come out of school yeah. knowing a lot of stuff. Um, the, the application aspect of, of all of that, we've had to work through on the fly, so mm -hmm. to speak, you know, and it's, it's like doing, doing, uh, doing engine work when the, when the RPMs are at 9,000. You know, I mean, it's 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 hard to do that. Yeah. So bringing a bringing a new fresh idea. I mean, Tyler has been extremely mm -hmm. when he when he joined our clinic system. I asked him, "What would you like to see done?" He's got a list. We're going through his list now, trying to get those implemented. But he's been there a year. He was he was flexible enough to just get in and learn our system very well. And now it's like, hey, what do you bring to the table yeah, now that we've is. got you up to speed? And and he's bringing some 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 heavy hitting stuff to the table. It's really exciting to see what he's going what he's going to do for us. Well, one last thing I'll leave you with is go be open minded. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because what you're learning right now is what Logan and your professors have felt are the best of the best right now. But I can tell you that there is a lot of stuff that people have learned. You know, we, we talk about what is evidence-based practice. Well, one key component is clinical experience. I mean, you know, and and and, and, and so, so I'd suggest that what you may think is the pinnacle of perfect practice when you graduate may evolve. It has for me, certainly. And so I'd say keep an open mind, too, because you might find a real mentor where you weren't expecting. So. You got one, and then we'll come right back to you. She, she's going to oh, do the mic real quick. Testing. Hey. <laughs> Hi, um, Dr. Tuck and Dr. Mathis. My name is Deshaw Bars, and my question um, to you is, where do you see your practice five to 10 years from now, based off of you saying this is the best time to be in chiropractic? You want, um, you want to go first? Wow. Or? We, we, Dr. Tuck and I have had the, the thrill over the last couple months of, of looking at the opportunities that are in front of just, just our, our clinic system. Um, it, it, we're, we're in the middle of one of those opportunities today, you know, to, to be able to come to an institution like Logan and just kind of just share what we're doing, tell our story of, of our ups and downs of going through this, this process over my tenure with the group has been, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's purifying for us. Um, hopefully it, it brings some light to, yeah, you, you can do this too. Um, where five to 10 years from now? I'll tackle that. Please one just do. I, so I think it's probably going to be in, in, in uh, two to three areas. Okay. Number one is going to be an integrative practice setting. I think those who embrace the 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 uh, uh, interdiscipline, or sorry, the uh, integrative approach to to to, to that care, um, it could be as simple as what some people call a medical neighborhood, where it's more of a collaborative relationship, much like what Lee described there, or it could be a very formal, such as what they're doing at Dell or in the VA system. I think that's one possibility that we'll probably see, and we hope to actually evolve and, and work as a part of. We also think it's going to be in group practices. I think that 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 the days of solo practitioners are probably limited um, because the cost of doing business in healthcare is not um, at the same pace as the reimbursement of healthcare. And so what's happened is is the margins have gotten thinner in the business of healthcare. And the only way to deal with that is going to be more of a collaborative kind of, uh, you know, we call it collective power, where we're able to share overhead, share talent, improve access to patients. Um, but it also comes with responsibility. And the responsibility is what we've tried to, to embrace, which is we need a guarantee when a patient shows up in our office, they're getting a certain standard of care, a certain quality of care. Um, so that way, people understand and know. I mean, one will tell you, and I, I know her name, but I won't tell her name right now for her sake, but I think she would probably wouldn't mind it. But they don't, people aren't asking anymore, does chiropractic work? That's what they asked 20 years ago when I was coming out of school. Now they're asking who to send them to. And that's a big difference in the question. I don't question whether it works now, I question who to send them to. Uh, the Gallup poll that was done with Palmer, they'll tell you that too. You know, the, our, our partner likes to, to repeat it often, but unfortunately he's right on point. We're the, we're the least trusted and, and, and the most loved. So why is that? Because when you find a relationship with a good chiropractor, You'll send everybody to them, but but do you but you don't know them, you know. And so how do you do? And so that's where we're hoping at the ACA, for example, to create a community of high quality doctors that people can trust when they see that. That's why when I go in the, the, the doors here, I love seeing the member of ACA. I love it because I think it says a it says a statement. We also are doing that same thing in our little corner of the world. When they see that somebody works at, at one of our groups, they know they're going to get a certain standard there. So we think those are two main ones. And the third one is probably going to be a, a, a self kind of self pay kind of type of, of, and that's probably where if somebody wants to be a solo practitioner, they can probably exist. Um, could be better. Please understand that you've got a lot to learn and that's not being denigrated to your education or you personally at all. Actually, every mentor will tell you that they learn as much from their mentee is as the mentee learns from their mentor. I, I just tell you that right now. I mean, I, I've learned more from this fella than I could ever I verbalize, you know? So I think that that's a key thing, but I think that's right. So what other questions do we got?
Nice man. Um, a couple years ago, the ACA put out a webinar on doing Medicare documentation, uh, trying to get the Medicare match from professional mm -hmm. being paid. And I'm just curious um, if there's any results of so that. Thank you for asking that question. So, actually, yes. Our preliminary data is showing great results. So, and for everybody in here, so what's happened is the OIG, and this is an interesting thing that even I didn't know. If I wasn't in my role at the ACA, I'd never understand it. So, office, uh, was it, uh, OIG stands for Office of something, something. Inspector Thank you, General. Inspector General. So, when they're coming in and giving these error rates, they're actually not looking at chiropractic. They're actually looking at Medicare and seeing how good a job they're doing. And so what ended up happening is, is that, that, that CMS was trying to figure out how to improve their numbers. And that's where we, at, at some key volunteers in, in our group, was able to go to the max. And that comment, I, I wish I could brag about that was my idea about getting a, 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 a kind of a, an agreement on what quality looks like. Actually, it started there. That idea came from that. And so they released a 2013 data, which made us look pretty uh, not so good. Uh, they just released a 2014 data that didn't look so good either. The problem is, is we didn't institute that pro program until like 2016. So when we started looking at our preliminary data, where we're going back in, at the local max and doing the spot checks on the error rates, it's actually dropped to like 30 some percent in the different regions where we've looked. So we're hoping and we believe that when you get into 16, 17, 18, you're going to see significantly significant drops in those error rates. Um, uh, it has made it more challenging when we are at Washington, Capitol Hill, and asking for a, a legislation to expand potentially the Medicare services that we're able to provide to improve patient access when they're pulling out the OIG report and going, yeah, but this says here, and then we explain it to them. And, uh, but it is seeing some great results. Um, uh, and, and, and actually, that the, the, the shameless plug that he made earlier, that's, we're updating that. Uh, the ACA is, 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 is updating that into this. And what we've done as part of that is actually added a patient conversation component. And, and, and Lee is the master at that. But, the, you know, it's, it's, you know, what are the conversations too? So we can have a good conversation with a Medicare patient about where care starts in the middle and then how does it end and how can we deal with the ABN component, which is basically just once you initiate an ABN, an advanced beneficiary notice that says this will not be covered by Medicare, all that is is electric care at that point. It's just, you know, and so so it's that that same concept. It's the same concept that we implemented in our group practice. If you've got the data that tells you where there's room for improvement, follow a, a logical path to train the doctors on how to improve those metrics. Then give them the feedback that lets them know where they're going. So they, the, the OIG report wasn't good in 13 and not much better in, in 14, but implemented in 16 a plan of action where the doctors are trained on how to do it correctly. Um, you'll, you'll see those incident rates drop. Um, again, the, the Medicare webinar, we're, it's, it's a very basic concept of let's start at the beginning. Let's define an episode of care of how to start it, how to go through it, how to end it properly. Then, going forward, you can hold doctors accountable to that learning that they've had. You don't take a first try and send them into part four boards. You get them to that point, then you test them, then you give them the feedback. And that's, you know, that's kind of the, the that's where we stole that concept from. Let's give them the information, tell them where they're starting, let's set a goal, map them out till they get it, and then hold them there. The accountability is, is a big part after they're appropriately trained. Um, you know, those of us who have children in the room, you can't just walk in and slap your teenage son, as much fun as that would be sometimes, without letting them know what they've done wrong, asking them to do better, and then having the accountability measures, accountability measures at the end. So it's, it's improving. There's a, there's a plan going forward as well. And I don't, and I don't want to take, I, I, I would, it'd be inappropriate for me not to acknowledge that I thought that the OIG report was very limited. Yeah. I thought they did a very small sampling and they set it up very difficult for us to have a great score. I think that needs to be acknowledged, but it is what it is. 
And so what are we going to do about it? And that's what the stance of, you know, we could, we could cry foul on the OIG, and, and, but the reality is if we do, there is a lot of opportunity for improvement, and, it's, and it is improving. So what other questions do we have? You know, one thing I do want to just uh, touch on very quickly, um, you know, we're, data collection is everything in, in today's world, and, and, and we realize that internally, and there's a lot of great sources for some data that's all showing that, that, that conservative care as a first option is, is right there. And, and uh, I will tell you what, where we're hoping to, uh, to, to do is, uh, for example, we've actually started tracking some of our data, just interesting data points for you guys. We found in the first two weeks of care, uh, a patient was re had a reduction of about 70% in pain. Uh, we also totaled up that dollar amount, and it was under $400. Uh, so we are able to have conversations directly with our patients about us, not what Optum says in there, but actually in our offices, we are able uh, and it, we're able to, in, seeing about a 70% reduction in pain, and, 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 and we're seeing it cost the patient less, less than $400. We're now hoping to follow that self-management uh, conversation and start asking these patients at six months, what did they do? What did they not do? And then we can start having, again, better conversations with our patients, sharing data that is a part of our providers in our area with what they're doing. And, and we feel that matching that data with some of the national data really uh, is a compelling story for not just our patients, but also for people looking for good options to refer their patients, in other words, PCPs and other specialists. So we're, we're excited to be pulling some of this data and, and, and following it. I gotta tell you, it's not been easy uh, it, because of some of it we've had to do, downright do manually because the systems are very difficult to tap into. Um, and so we're, 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 that's a struggle we deal with every day. But I got to tell you, uh, when you start looking at the data, it's very exciting. And, uh, and to tap on what we mentioned in your class earlier, a, a lot of what we had to do to get that data not more easily mined, but more pertinent when it was mined from our EHR is a consistent diagnostic coding system. ICD-10 is wide open. Having guidelines and boundaries around, you know, the way our doctors diagnose it has been extremely helpful in that. Um, you know, and, and, and it's almost a guideline, if you will, if, a, if we, we talked about it earlier, you know, how many diagnosis codes do you put down for the patient? Well, it's related to what you're treating. Um, you know, getting that and, and that definition and that, that clinical decision making on the doctor's part um, within a usable framework was a big part of that frustration that we had. Um, we've had some doctors from varying schools that want to put 12 diagnosis codes on every patient that comes in. That's very hard to pull data from. You know, that's, that's kind of a, a shotgun type approach, if you will. Um, so there's, there's multiple different types of, of frustrations that we've um, run into when it comes to that. So it, we're probably coming to the close, so I'll leave with this one comment, and that is, we talked about continuous improvement, and we're in that same boat. We don't even begin to think that we've crested anywhere close to the pinnacle of the perfect scenario, and the truth is, even if we thought we had, it would change. Um, all we can do is take the information that we're continuing uh, to gather and try to improve for who we are and keeping the main thing, the main thing, and that is that we're keeping in the best interest of our patients in mind, um, using good information to do that. So we're happy. I just I would hate for anybody to think that when I left here that, that you know, that or when you leave here that we're saying we're perfect and that's just the way it is because we know we're not. We know we have room for improvement every day, and, and I think that's what keeps us going is that, that, that ability to see can we make it better, can we improve. And we feel like it's been ingrained in our culture now, and I'm proud of that. And uh, so um, we're going to be here for a little while longer. Uh, we're easy to find. So if you have any questions in the future, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thank you again for your hospitality. This has been a wonderful experience. Um, and we appreciate uh, your time tonight. So thank you, guys. Thank you. And I want to just close, but I want to really thank Dr. Tuck and Dr. Mathis. That's a great job. I wish there was more students here to hear this because you know, you got a national grad, Palmer grad, national Palmer, Dr. Evans. You know, everyone 
the, the dirty little secret, about 85% of what you're taught, every other school teaches, because that's what the CCE mandates we teach and NBC. There's a standard to the profession. I've been bugging Ray with the ACA. We need a National Practice Act. We need a baseline. So we're all the same. We're in five different states here, and I can't tell you, you know, what I could do in one border versus the other. We need, we desperately need a National Practice Act, and that's, we're pushing more to that. So what makes, what's the 15% difference between Logan and, and National and wherever else you're going? Pretty much after five years, not much. It's hard to tell where you came from. First five years, not bad. <laughs> I can tell you where you came from. But in reality, we all start to learn stuff because I, I can guarantee you, if Logan Basic worked really well on Dr. Mathis, guess what he's gonna go learn? Logan Basic. When I got out of school, I knew how to do flexion, distraction, hot packs, and a, a diversified. And that was about it. And then someone showed me a myofascial tool, and I'm like, huh. And then K-tape, and then other stuff. And I'm like, well, this stuff kind of worked. So I think it's important for the students to understand and for us to understand too. Dr. Tuck and Dr. Mathis made a great deal. What, how do you make yourself marketable? Keep an open mind, because I can't tell you, I've been in practice for 30 years and 20 some on years and student come back from a seminar and goes, I got the answer. I know how to fix everything, you should do this. I don't know why you're doing it, you should do this. You know, if I believed everything I heard in a seminar or an infomercial, I'd be 50 pounds lighter and a full head of hair. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. So in reality, I think it was great advice. I think it's a, it's a really shining example of what this profession is going towards and what we're trying to do at Logan. So what is, our, what is my job here as the dean for the 15%? Dr. Tuck and Dr. Mathis, when they're looking for something, they're looking for Logan because you're ready when you leave and you understand the environment you're going into. And that, that's hard sometimes because you're battling philosophies, you're battling this. And I have to tell you that it's, it's not just us, it's the profession. The OIG report, every time NCLC comes into play, somehow every congressman magically gets a copy of the OIG report. You think a congressman has the OIG report on Medicare for chiropractic? Where do you think they got it? Not from the ACA. So if you have a philosophical difference, now is that patient-centered care? Is that hurting the patients by limiting access to chiropractic because you have a philosophical rift with what somebody, some other association believes? That's, that, that's got to stop. So our job at Logan is, our 15% of the profession is, you don't do that. You may disagree, but coming out of here, we can have a conversation, we can talk, we can be the next Ray and Lee, and Jason and Erica and Dr. Mercer, everyone. We can come, Dr. Goodman, Dr. Evans, sorry. Dr. Montgomery, we need another Dr. Montgomery. Dr. Brinkman, Dr. Bertel, who's gonna replace us? You guys, so again, thank you guys. We can't, I can't appreciate it enough. I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let you have this, give it back to Tyler. Back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Good. They'll be around for a little bit if you want to talk and, and ask questions. And thank you guys for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it.